I was one of the first grant recipients um, back in 2015, not the very first round, um, but the second round in May. And I got a grant, I mean, I'm sorry, in 16. The first round was November 15, and then I was May of 16. Um, I got a grant to go to um, Malaysia to figure out what we were going to do for a conservation project over there. So I went ahead and um, I went to what was called the uh, Wildlife Welfare Project, and that was in conjunction with the Orangutan SSP and their field advisory group. Um, and so also, I'll get into it, but Eight Malaysia, who I'll talk about a little more, who's a conservation organization um, over in Malaysia, and then uh, the Malacca Zoo and Night Safari. So I, sorry, I flew in to KL, um, and that was a, about, it's about a 36 hour travel time from here over to there. Um, and so I flew into there, and then we drove down, which is a two hour drive to Malacca. And that's where the zoo was. And we spent two weeks on this project, um, again, with Eight Malaysia and the Malacca Zoo and Night Safari. And what happened was, when we first got there, it was kind of this big deal. Everything's kind of um, formal uh, in the beginning when you meet people over there. So what happened was a bunch of us that went, there was a, um, a lot of people from different zoos across the United States that went. And it was the first time that the orangutan SSP had opened it up outside of orangutan keepers. So we had people from education, we had people from maintenance, we had people from horticulture um, that all joined us, which was really nice because we knew we'd be doing a lot at the zoo. Um, but the first thing we did was we presented our gifts to them, and it's stuff that they kind of had on their wish list. Like they didn't have hot wire testers that worked. Um, we brought pony collars and hot wire testers. There was falconry gloves, um, Kong toys. Uh, my roommate actually there had an entire suitcase full of Kong toys. Um, so <laughs> that was kind of interesting to travel with. Um, and then after that, we broke up into groups. So this is a map of the Malacca Zoo. And as you can see, it's quite large. Uh, it's about 54 acres, uh, and it's very forested, which is wonderful. Um, but the interesting thing was, if you see that red circle around that bottom half, that's what they call their hoofstock area, and that's one team. And that's the team I got assigned to to lead and help out. And then, like I said, there was like 13 of us. Everybody else got split up into pairs of two and like worked on these teams. So it was me with a team of seven and like hundreds of animals and then we had like a team of two girls that worked with the orangutans and the capuchins and their two keepers. <laughs> so I had my work cut out for me for sure. Uh, so they had some ponies um, that they trained and this keeper was very dedicated to his ponies. Uh, we had giraffe on my team. They have actually four giraffe here. Uh, a mother, father, and baby, and then another giraffe in a different section, uh, the African safari. They had Malayan tapers. They also had, um, I think the next one's, yeah, so they had rhinos and this really cute wild beast that was in with the rhinos. Um, and they aren't very creative with their names, but the rhinos' names and the Malayan tapers' names were both boy and girl, and they were male and female. Um, and as I show you these pictures, keep in mind that standards are a li little different there, and I was prepared for maybe the worst, but they actually take great care of their animals um, and did the best they could with what they had. Uh, this is that African safari I was talking about that's a mixed species kind of boardwalk walkthrough. This is the Ancoli um, yard, and you can see they have a ton of <clears throat> these. And um, one little guy, he was the smallest on the team, there he is, Daniel. He took care of this whole yard every morning, plus four other exhibits. Uh, and then there's some wildlife at the zoo as well. So those are actual termites, and this went on for miles. Uh, and they just, and then it was gone like after two hours, but this is, and then that's a real termite mound. So they don't have fake termite mounds there like we do. And then um, this guy, <laughs> after I'd been working out and cutting down bamboo and doing all those things, they were like, oh yeah, just make sure you're careful because there's like 17 venomous snakes here. And that one was called the 100 step snake. 
uh, and if you get bit, you have 100 steps before you die. So that's cool. We found him right on ground. Um, <laughs> they do have a lot of fresh browse, and so that's really nice for their animals and their grazers. This is our lunch every day. There is meat, but I didn't eat meat, so um, I always gave it to someone else. Uh, and that's their little restaurant. That's where we ate every day. Um, I passed over it, but that was a keeper area. That was their keeper area where you saw my pink backpack. Um, we also did medical procedures with them. So this is one of the Ann Coley who has obviously a wound. Um, and this is how they do their procedures. This guy is big. That's their vet giving them an injection. We just make do with what we have. Their banana leaves worked great for everything. So that's what we use to keep the surface clean. Uh, here we are just waiting for it to go down, which it never went down fully, um, but they were able to irrigate it. This is another procedure we helped them do. This is the first time this team had worked together to do a medical procedure. Uh, so this is a um, water buck who she had a bone protruding from her hoof. And so we anesthetized her. The whole team worked together. It was a really good team builder. They really liked it. The whole time this was going on, I was inside scrubbing and disinfecting her stall because she wouldn't move for them because she was in pain, so it was really dirty. Uh, so she came back to a clean stall, uh, and this procedure went really, really well. Uh, when I went back and visited this year in August, she looked great, and she has a baby. So uh, she obviously pulled through just fine. Uh, and she's shifting really well for them now. So we worked on some training behaviors as well as enrichment. And so uh, the training behaviors we did, again, was shifting. Uh, we did some standing side presentations for the rhinos. And then we did a lot of enrichment building. They didn't really know about enrichment. And they have so much stuff on grounds so that we didn't have to buy anything because they're saying, we don't have any money. And I was like, you don't need money here. So. Um, this is what they built, a floating raft for the Malayan tapers, and they loved it. Uh, and then they were building these uh, feeders for the rhinos. The rhinos played with that thing for like two hours. It was great. And the public all gathered and watched, and it was really exciting. So it's nice for them to know, you know, things that we did. And if you look down there in that corner, or I can't even point to it, but there was a little pole. That's what the giraffe was eating off of. So we went ahead and gathered materials that we found on grounds and built the giraffe a higher feeder so she didn't have to lean over. Uh, this is the big project we did together, the sun bear exhibit. You can see the before and after. That's our entire group that worked on the sun bear exhibit, and then the sun bears got to come out. They also have a baby now, and they love, love, love that. We had a celebration at the end where all of the keepers got a certificate if they actually participated, which was nice because not everybody did. This is part of my group, and as you can see, they have zoo shirts on, and they still share these pictures with me. They wear these all the time. Um, so they were in love with it. This is Casey, who worked with Eight Malaysia. That was my partner, and he actually is a supervisor at the zoo now. And this is Osri. He works at the Sun Bear Center, uh, who also helped with our group a little bit. And this is the t-shirt they made me before I left. Um, t it says my name on the front, because I'm Team Hoofstock now. So after that, I flew over to Borneo. And I uh, visited the orangutan sanctuary. And they, it's just a rehab and release uh, situation there. And then the Sun Bear Center. They do both rehabbing and release, but they also have permanent center for sun bears, which is getting pretty overstocked. And then uh, the last place we visited was the Discovery Center. And this was a very quick trip, so that's why you're not going to see a lot now. But all these pictures you see, I took in the wild. So they have hornbills just flying around, uh, <laughs> macaques everywhere. They're like squirrels here. It, at the zoo, the langers and the macaques would just come down and steal all the animals' food uh, and all kinds of crazy bugs. And yeah, I was a little more afraid of those. But this was the best thing I saw. So we were just walking around a nature center area. And here comes this guy. And of course, we're all freaking out. Some of the locals are just like walking by. And we're like, hey, do you see this? Uh, so um, we got to see this orangutan in the wild. And you'll see in a second my camera kind of move. Uh, and that's because now we're running to see where it was going. Um, and this is who it was. So uh, I'm not sure if it was a male or female. I'm pretty sure it was a female. She was going to visit who I can only assume was her mother and her little brother or sister. So there was three of them that we got to see that time in the wild, which was very awesome and unique. And then after that, we flew down to uh, Bali. 
and Bali was a really neat experience. We just went there to visit the Bali Safari and Marine Park and learn about what they were doing for conservation and what their zoo setup was. So you get on the entrance is one of these trams, but it's not a safari ride. It takes you back to the zoo entrance and everything in Bali is very culture based. So this, everything you're seeing is inside the Bali Zoo. So they have statues and sh um, different things everywhere and then they're very show based. Um, so you can't barely see it, but those are guinea pigs running across their mixed mammal show. Um, and then keep in mind again, there's different standards, so you're going to see some things in a minute um, that you're, we would never do. Uh, but there's some binturongs running around as well, and before that was a free-flighted hornbill that they had guest interaction with. Uh, but they do work free contact with their orangutans, which is what you're going to see next. Uh, but they are excellent trainers and they do take care of their animals very well. Um, you're going to see a lot of free contact stuff coming up that might shock you a little bit. Uh, but all, I was very, very impressed because all of their shows are very conservation message based and um, very informative, but the guests are totally into it the whole time. Uh, so that is not a real elephant. <laughs> it's a statue, but right next to it, uh, these guys are real. And so you could walk right up to them and feed them. And there's really no ledge. I almost fell into that pool because I was taking pictures. Uh, but here's the tiger show. And there, you're going to see a video in a second. Um, you'll see a couple videos as I talk through it. But they do all of their shows in three different languages. Um, and they do show, you can see that tiger up there climbing on the rocks, a lot of natural behavior. Um, and this next, oh, and then again, they always bring their culture um, back into every element of their shows. And then here we go with another uh, natural behavior, which was awesome to me. I want to do this here Where's so bad. And those things are really, really high. Uh, you can't tell as much in my picture. This next one's going to freak you out. Uh, but that is not the wall. <laughs> There's a glass wall beyond that, uh, that that little yellow sign's on, because it looks like he's getting ready to climb out. But still, if he wanted to, he could climb out over that other glass wall that's beside it. And so I'm like it conflicted to be in the audience, like, the should, I, should I feel okay? Should I get up and body. leave? Like, is it going to get out? Um, but again, I, I, was, I was really nervous because like they, the trainers would run around with their meat on their side and the, ti like, the tigers were trained to run after them. And I was thinking, that is, okay. But like it all works for them and you just have to keep an open mind. Um, that last picture they were showing the tiger and human animal conflict. The next is the elephant. Um, show or program, again, it's very conservation based and it goes through the whole history of elephants. You'll hear her talking about it a little bit, but again, a whole free contact situation. Like the forest was peaceful. There was plenty of food and space for humans and animals to live happily together. Elephants were once many in Sumatra and Kuti Island. But the I thought elephants this was really live cool. in a very large group which are led by the most experienced female in the group. The females are usually able to give birth at the age of 10 years to a single cow after a... So in that first video, I don't know if you heard her say, like, there was a lot of space for both elephants and humans. And then the story goes on in this next picture where the elephants come back out and they're, like, knocking down the village trees and eating stuff. And it goes into this whole thing about human-animal conflict and they act like they're shooting the elephants and then... Um, it goes into this where this guy's fallen in and is drowning and the elephant saves him and they talk about how they can live together, which is a good message over there because that's real. That's every day. Um, then you do get on a tram and you go through, which would be like Animal Kingdom if you've been there. And I mean, I just included baby hippo pictures because baby hippos are so cute. Um, and then there's like baby rhinos. Uh, so as we were driving around, we had a host with us from the zoo and I said, this looks a lot like Animal Kingdom. Oh, and that's another statue at the zoo. 
um, I said, this looks a lot like Animal Kingdom. And they said, well, none of us had ever been to Africa when we were designing this. So they flew us to Animal Kingdom, and we just designed it off of that. So it looks a lot like Animal Kingdom, which brings me to what I came home to, which um, that kind of went fast, but the CREATE project is what we came up with when we came back. And it's a habitat restoration project right there in that orange spot in Borneo, uh, Saba to be exact, uh, and the lower Kitabintongan rainforest and on the river there. And so this is a very biodiverse area. It's one of the most, bio, if not one of the most biodiverse areas in the world. Um, it's, their forest there is actually way, way older than the Amazon rainforest, so there's a lot of history and a lot of, like I said, biodiversity there. They, um, have, they have the biggest um, number of primates all in one space. They have 10, ten different types, which doesn't occur anywhere else. Uh, they also have, there's a lot of different species of hornbills all over the world, um, but right here in this location, there's eight out of the 10 species that are found in Malaysia. Um, and I was lucky enough to see seven out of the eight of them when I was there this last time. It's just, so you saw I was there for a really quick time the first time, but this time when I went back um, in August to visit our habitat restoration site, see what was going on, um, it's mind blowing. Like, it, it, I cannot believe the amount of wildlife that is there that you see just walking around. One night I was, um, I went up, I think to download my pictures to try to send to Steven, which was a nightmare there. But um, I went up to download my pictures and I came back and a, a group that I was working with, um, they're not, I wasn't with anybody, any zookeepers, anything like that. They were these people from the UK and they were like, Stacia, Stacia, you have to tell us what we just saw. And I was like, okay. And I thought maybe it'd be a langer or, you know, something. And they kept describing this thing, and they were like, it was black, and it was kind of fuzzy, and it was kind of big, and it just ran across right here, like right in front of where we were staying. And, I, and so they were trying to tell them it was all these different kinds of like cats, and they were like, no, no, no. And so I was like, if I show them this picture, and they say this is what it is, I'm going to die, because you never see them. And it was, it was a binturong. So they saw a binturong that night, and I missed it. Um, but even the locals rarely see them. But yeah, I just cruised on by where we were hanging out that night. So you see everything there. Like I said, langers, they're just all over the place. Um, so it's a really cool area, and it's very important. So Project Borneo is what this first started out as, and then it became the CREATE project. Um, which is um, a restor habitat restoration project that we are doing with um, partnering with Eight Malaysia, who's the group I worked with the first time I was there. They're an amazing conservation group that is in the know about everything. They're extremely trustworthy, which is very difficult to find, um, especially in this part of the world. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but things happen so quickly over there and politics change so quickly that um, even some of the rehab facilities that are great for five years switch management and can get corrupted into doing something else and then you, you can't really trust them anymore. And uh, these guys are wonderful. They're in the know about everything and they have a lot of connections. So when I reached out to a bunch of people when I got back, they weren't the only group we talked about, but we just knew that we wanted to do something that was long lasting, made a great impact, and you know something that doesn't have to be directly related to animal work. So we're not directly working with any of the animals that this project is positively affecting, but we're doing something that's gonna be long term. So uh, like I said, we partnered with Ape Malaysia. We uh, purchased four acres of habitat that is um, where de deforestation has occurred down on that, the river that I'm going to show you in a minute. And um, we started planting trees that we purchased from local greenhouses. And we have two local villagers, which was super important for us um, because, one, Although it's like a greenhouse itself there, you can't just plant trees and walk away because everything grows so quickly. So within months, the weeds and the tall grasses will just strangle these little saplings and that'll be the end of it. Um, if you do take care of them and do the maintenance, they'll grow very quickly, which you'll see in a minute. 
Um, but the, back to the villagers, it was very important for us because you can't go anywhere and say, hey, this is what you guys need to do. Uh, you know, this is the right thing to do. You have to have local buy-in, and they're the ones that are going to make this project go on and on forever. And there is a lot of local buy-in in Borneo because they all have recognized how precious this area is that they live in, and they all take a lot of pride in it. So they are trying to work on ecotourism, but they're working on it the right way. They are trying to limit it, and they're trying to make sure that all of the locals are the ones that are being employed and getting the money. And so that's important to us um, as well. So we have two local villagers that they go out and maintain our plots and they will continue to do that for the next four years until they're ready um, to not be maintained anymore. Uh, and then we also generate the active participation of the nursery care and tree planting of the saplings with some youngsters um, there that are really interested but aren't old enough to do the full job yet. And then they will move on to be um, like what we have as we call them the tree planting squad. Uh, and once our two uh, tree planting squad guys got the job and are so excited, we've had a lot of people approach Eight Malaysia and ask how they can get on board, which is really good. So um, our project we thought it would start off really slow, uh, but it took off way quicker than we imagined. We've already had two other zoos join us, and we went from only going to have a couple saplings uh, or a couple hundred saplings to now we're over several thousand saplings. And we've added, we started with four acres, we're almost to six acres already. Uh, so that's really exciting. Um, and like I told you before, I, this is just kind of some facts, but of the biodiversity that's there, 250 birds, 50 mammals, 20 reptile species, uh, and then the plants and flowers, it's phenomenal um, what's down there. And so it's just a super important area. Uh, so the key factor with this is too, a lot of people aren't doing restoration work there because it is so expensive for them. So if we can help on that one piece, then they can take off and do this successfully. So that's um, what we're doing is we're breaking down that one single barrier because they all have the means to do it. They're all really good at it, but they can't afford to do it on their own at this point. So again, I kind of went over this already. We want to, uh, one thing I kind of skipped over was we want to engage the local community. When I was there, we stayed, I'll show you some pictures, but we stayed with local villagers. We ate in the local villagers' house. That's another way to get, like some of the women don't do a lot of that, the type of work that they're going to be doing tree planting, but they're called aunties and uncles, um, anybody that's an adult. And so we went to a different auntie's house every day and evening for lunch, and they prepared a full meal. And that's um, how they make their income and ecotourism can support them. But it's very awesome because you're learning all about um, this, you know, their lifestyle and their culture. They taught us cultural dances. The like, it's like, this sounds terrible, but it's like in a movie, like the oldest lady in the village taught me how to play this like instrument that she made with like nails and bamboo. And like she just came around and like sat with us for like an hour and wanted to share her craft. So it was really cool. But the reason we have habitat restoration issue or needs is because of this. And these are all pictures I took from the plane. And that's palm oil for days. Like, uh, when we were driving down to the river, I just videotaped for 20 minutes, and then I just turned the video camera off because it was just palm, palm plantations, one after the other. Um, but one thing a lot of people don't know, and I've talked about it in some other videos, is especially where our sites are, a lot of the problem is back from logging 30 and 40 years ago, and not just the palm plantations that are happening now. Um, and so... Both of our sites were staging areas where they would cut the hardwood down in the forest and then get them all up close to the river and lay them there or stage them there until they were ready to tie them up and float them down the river for exportation. And so um, it just was sat there long enough that stuff can't grow back. And so, well, on its own. Uh, so that's why we're trying to go in and help those places. But people don't think about that either, and that's what we have to think about as a group things that we're doing now might not rear their ugly face for another 30 or 40 years. And then there's a problem that we're creating. So we kind of have to start forward thinking about that. Because uh, a lot of people will say, oh, it's all, all about the palm oil plantations there. Well, it's not. 
it was about logging and now they have what they're called secondary forests because they've cut down the primary forest and all those hardwoods. Um, you will see some videos or some pictures in a little bit of me standing next to one of the tallest hardwoods, but it's in a separate forest um, that is under private ownership that somebody hasn't encroached on yet uh, that we went into there and saw some really neat stuff. Um, oh, Kelsey, there you go. <laughs> Kelsey, I'm going to have Kelsey play a video for me, um, and it's just going to kind of show you what I've been talking about, and then I'll go back into my presentation. And this is where our restoration site is, and this is Sukau on the lower Kinematong, Kinematongan Rainforest. This is one of their ecotourism places. No, I didn't stay anywhere like that. <laughs> the Kinematangan is a huge floodplain, it's the largest in the country. Completely lowland, flat forests, a few limestone outcrops. Beautiful place. And my favorite in Borneo for wildlife. You have very different uh, habitat types and ecosystems right next to each other. All the iconic species are represented there from the elephant, the orangutan, gibbons, clouded leopards, crocodile, and the hornbills, of course. This is a very special species. Um, huge pot belly, big long nose. They only inhabit forests right next to major rivers. So, in the Kinabatangan, being the largest river in Sabah and one of the major rivers within Borneo, without a doubt in my mind, it's the best place to see proboscis. Well, the, the best times to go on a cruise would be early morning and late afternoon. The skies are gorgeous, sunsets are great, and it's when the animals are most active. Bird life, they're singing in the morning, uh, and in the evening, that's when the elephants and orangutans are most likely on the riverbanks. All the primates are out, the sunset is there, the, the light is perfect for photography, just relaxing on the boat, taking everything in. Well, one of the major draws in the Kinematangan is the uh, Bornean elephant. They're usually active around late afternoon when they appear at the riverbanks to feed. You turn off your engine, you stay at a distance, and you hear their ears flap. And when they chew, that's my favorite sound in the animal kingdom, really. When their ears flap, it's, it's really magical. And every once in a while, on their migration routes, they do cross the river, and the little ones gather in the middle. They put their trunks up like snorkels. You don't see their eyes much. They're both bodies on the water. You don't get to see that very often, but when you do, it's, it's quite a treat. So I know travel videos can be like, glorify everything. That's what it looks like. Like, that, they didn't have to do much work to make that video. Great. We didn't, we weren't, when people go into ecotourism, they, they are um, just doing the boat tours, but that's how you get everywhere. So we technically did boat tours twice a day, um, and we did get up early, and it wasn't, I mean, you did see the wildlife, but it's really hot there. And so, and humid, and so we started work at five in the morning, and we would do the maintenance on the plots, and, or, you know, if we were planting saplings that day, and we'd work until, early afternoon and then we'd come in and eat and kind of hang out for a minute and then we'd go back out uh, a little closer to, 
dusk and go do whatever else we needed to do. And then our ride back was always in the sunset, um, which was really awesome. I did not have the privilege to see elephants when I was there. I was very disappointed, so I hope to see them sometime. Um, but, you know, in some of these, uh, you couldn't hear it in that video, but it, the noise is amazing because it's really quiet, but at the same time you can hear everything. And when we were planting on the plots, um, we'd find the elephant dung and we'd always see footprints and we'd see things, but like you could hear these elephants. And those, el they're pygmy Asian elephants, but don't get confused, they're not little. They're just a tiny bit smaller than the regular Asian elephants. Um, you could hear them, but you could not see them. And it's weird because I don't know how they disguise themselves so well, but there was a group of 17 of them traveling around that uh, the two weeks I was there, but um, only one uh, boatsman saw them that entire two weeks. Uh, so it's you could see when you'd go out the next day, all the grass would be laid down where they had come to the water and all of that, but no one would ever see them. And they're these gigantic animals in the middle of the forest. But <laughs> uh, Maz, who also works with Ape Malaysia, he was down there doing some projects recently. And he, uh, we talk regularly and he was like, oh, Stacia, you're gonna be really disappointed because I finally saw elephants because he's typically, typically in KL at the office. And I said, oh, I was like, don't even tell me about it. And he's like, well, I have to tell you because we were doing restoration work and these elephants just came onto the site and we had to like run away because they were just coming right through. Um, but it is amazing because these trees are really small and our elephants here, you know, would just <laughs> go through and like eat them all. They just like walk around them. They don't mess them up. The bigger ones they'll kind of rub on and we'll have to like, we had to straighten several up each day when we'd go to different sites because an elephant had leaned on it, but they would, they did not destroy them. And it's obviously they must prefer stuff because they know they have much larger things they can eat. But I was amazed at how big these creatures were. Uh, but again, this is what we're dealing with. Like that was right by where I was staying. And here, you know, is a lot of pictures of what I saw. Uh, like he said, it's the clouds, they're crazy. The environment is very um, neat. And um, that's at sunset when we were coming back from one of our restoration sites. Uh, again, the wildlife, you see something different every day. We kept a list and it just kept getting bigger and bigger. That is palm. Uh, the stuff on the left, or maybe it's your right, is red that's getting ripe when it's completely red they'll harvest it it's one of the fastest reproducing fruits that's why they do that um, this is uh, me with one of those hardwoods uh, and as you can see it's ridiculously tall and ginormous uh, that's an elephant track uh, that had just happened because it didn't rain until later that day so um, that is the little guy that was sitting on by the tree next to me while i was planting Oh, that is a viper. Yeah, yeah. And then I was uh, lucky enough to see a group of orangutans on our very last day. Uh, so they were in there playing in the trees and hanging out and doing all kinds of fun stuff. They were nest building. This is their greenhouses. I bet you weren't thinking that's what they looked like, but these are the greenhouses that we buy the saplings from. And this is that 5 a.m. trip with all of our stuff, taking these saplings out to plant. Uh, this is Mark from Ape Malaysia. He's teaching the group how to plant. Um, they do host volunteer work groups. Uh, this is our restoration site that has not been clear cut yet. It's two and a half acres. Uh, right here, we're doing maintenance and starting to clear cut um, one of the areas. These are our two local villagers and one of, there are other plot that has been planted. I asked them how much it would take, how much time it would take those two to clear cut that one just by themselves, which they're going to do. And um, they said, maybe two weeks. So it's me, okay. <laughs> um, so these guys know exactly what they're doing. And um, my slideshow kind of turned off, but that is the end of all my pictures because I didn't, like I said, I didn't know how long it would go because I had so many. But we, you know, just embarked on this habitat restoration project. I know it took me a long time to kind of present on this trip, but I knew when I came back last November um, that we were working on something big and I didn't know quite what it was gonna be. So then when we launched it in June and then people started jumping on board in July and August, it kind of got really big really quick. Um, so it is on our website that people can donate to other institutions. That's who we're re reaching out to now. Um, 
anybody in the community can if they want, um, but we're really hoping that we can just kind of be that center um, unit for people to come to that maybe don't have as large amount of money as we do to invest in a project like this, but they can purchase so many saplings or acres and we're going to grow this project. Um, uh, just as a heads up, we will be hosting the orangutan workshop in 2018, uh, so here next year, and um, we are going to bring two of the people from Ape Malaysia over. Uh, Mark, who you saw planting the trees, he is actually born and raised in Saba. He has a lot of published pictures. He is a book of knowledge, um, and so he's going to do a presentation. He's the one that heads the Habitat Restoration Project, and then Maz, or Mazrul is his full name. He kind of runs the office side and has done some very unique, um, he's a PhD student, he has done some very unique research um, with orangutans that he has the opportunity to do over there that we cannot do here, um, that he's also gonna speak about. Um, and I have, the orangutan workshop will obviously be a closed workshop for participants, but we have asked them to speak to the zoo um, one evening while they're here, so that should be really exciting if you want to hear more from people that know a whole lot about, a whole lot more about it than I do. Um, but I would give you a heads up if you are interested um, and you're an employee of the zoo to look for those field trips with the SSP. Um, they're every other year, so there will be one in 18 and then one in 20. Um, but we have really tried to reach out to more than just specifically orangutan keepers, but even zoo keepers. Because like I said, if you saw all that work we did at the Malacca Zoo, it was a ton of maintenance work, a ton of horticulture work, a lot of building, a lot of training. So everybody kind of split up and did their own thing and they were very appreciative. I went back um, when I just went in August and they still were so excited. They had done a lot of improvements, um, but again, Although their way is a little different, I learned a ton from them. They have ridiculous ways to like tie up their brows that like I was mesmerized by and it took me like all of the two weeks to figure out how to do it on my own. Um, but they had a lot of unique things to teach us as well. So it was a very unique and um, really neat uh, opportunity for me. But uh, getting into the, people always ask me, how did, how did that happen? You know, and when I was there, I, was doing a lot of legwork on meeting people and talking to people. And then when I came home, I spent from December through February talking to all the contacts I had made to get different conservation opportunities in line. And I presented about four or five of them back to the committee and we decided on this one. Um, but it can happen because <laughs> it did for me and you just kind of have to put it in there. But if somebody's really wanting to do the work and help make the connections, it'll it'll fall in your lap because there's always people looking for help. So uh, I'm here to answer questions now. I know I've been talking for a long time. I have no idea what time it is, but if anybody has questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yes. So how long after the saplings are planted do you think it'll be before it's like the mature forest that you want to do? Okay, well, I'm glad you did ask that because I forgot to touch ba touch on that because there was supposed to be three videos. Huh? Oh, she wants to know how long it takes for those saplings to grow and then when they won't need maintenance any or have to have maintenance anymore. And I'm glad she asked because I did have three videos that we were going to try to include in this um, where I took you to three different sites while I was there and talked about them, but they won't work. Um, so I will tell you about it. I feel bad that I skipped over that part. Um, so they start out as saplings and they're about, I don't know, a foot tall maybe. We plant them within, when I went to the next site that had been planted three or four months before I got there, they were already three and four feet tall. And then we went to a site that had been planted two and a half years ago and they were, some of them were 10 and 15 feet tall. And then um, at, it's always between three and four years, and then at four years, they're like towering and they're fine. And we have seen nesting even in the two and a half year old, two and a half year old planting sites, um, but they haven't seen orangutans, but they nest build every night, so we know that they're using it already. Um, but we have seen connected canopies in the ones that they have tried. Um, and they, one reason we went with this too is, 
again, you have to put that work in and have that maintenance done because a lot of places don't have a high success rate with this. And so you'll hear some debate about, is this what we should be doing or not? Um, this program that we do has an 85 to 90% success rate. Um, and that's because we're constantly monitoring and maintaining. While they're out there too, they always do um, observation of wildlife documents. They're not like, that's not what they're doing. They're planting and maintaining, but they have record sheets that we fill out every day or they fill out every day that says this is what we've seen. Um, so it's really neat to see what all comes through there because it's shocking. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Susan, will there be any kind of a, uh, you know, like a program for travel that the zoo is going to encourage to get more of the community outside of keepers involved? So our question was, is there going to be an opportunity for people outside in the, or in the community to travel? Um, we have brought that up um, and we've, we're thinking about it. We're just not there yet, uh, but we would like to entertain that idea, hopefully in the near future. Uh, one thing is some of the people outside the community don't understand some of the conditions that you're in if you're doing the restoration work. So we're debating on do you take them and show them the site and let them you know, have their choice of staying at nicer facilities and not participating in the project or do you go for the people that want to be more hands on. Um, so it's a lot to look into plus um, you have to like the 36 hour travel people have to be ready for that. and. Um, you know, it just depends on who we think would like to go and what they would like to do. So it's some logistics as well. So we're looking into it, so hopefully. Anybody else? Yes. Do you have an idea of about how much money it costs per sapling to do this restoration? Have you done any math to figure out? Yeah, we have, and, and oh, she wants to know how much it is per sapling. Uh, we have done the math, or I haven't, Ape Malaysia did, because when we were originally talking about letting people donate, we were going to maybe do buy sapling, and I think it's fairly inexpensive. Don't quote me on this, because we went a different direction, so now I don't remember right off the top of my head, but it's about $7, um, but that $7 includes s some other um, aspects of it besides just the sapling. Um, originally, we were going to open up donating or contributing to the project where people could just say, I want to buy so many saplings. But like I said, we have a lot of money invested in this and we can only employ two local villagers. And so we just the last night I was there, we had a meeting of the minds and we all sat down and started talking about where we go from here, what's going to happen. And um, I just, and we had already had somebody come on board before I left Audubon Zoo. And so I just said, I'm afraid that this is going to grow really quickly. I mean, that's a great problem to have, but we don't want to have all these people purchasing saplings that we can't plant or take care of. Um, so that's why we decided we'd go the zoo route and start with a, a bigger sum of money um, for organizations that are looking for a smaller donation for an organization, but bigger than just purchasing a couple saplings. Um, so on our website, you can look at it though. It'll tell you what like $500 gets you, which is basically, this many, many saplings, but we made sure we put in there that it's going to also ha include some purchases for the tools and, you know, some manpower and things like that because we want it to get really big, but we don't want it to get so out of control that we can't maintain it. Um, so that's how we've worked it out right now. But we think once it grows a little bit more, then we will be able to open it up for smaller donations. What I was thinking is maybe you could figure out what all the costs, like, the cost of maintaining them, the cost of your yeah. employees. Like if, you know, so rather than just $7 to buy the sapling, how much does it cost? It is included in there. So that is the seven, but they don't have all of those villagers trained and they don't have everything they need. Right, so we're waiting to grow it a little more, but then it will be that way and we can open it up to where you can just purchase saplings, which is our ideal position to be in, but we wanted to make sure we didn't get ahead of ourselves. Yes? I'm just curious, uh, on the legal side, who actually owns title to that, and, and what happens if the government gets followed? So it's actually a wildlife sanctuary, a government, and the government is totally on board with it. Um, the people that actually, I don't know how the ownership works, but the people that actually divvy out the acreage 
is World Wildlife Fund. Um, so they have, World Wildlife Fund has what they call the corridor of life, um, and that's just what they created a name for, but many people um, can get into it, but they're not, there's not a zoo out there that's actually has the acreage and has their own project. They're doing what kind of what we were talking about, just giving some money to help somebody else do that. Um, so it is a government sanctioned um, wildlife sanctuary. And I will tell you uh, one neat story um, was you saw all of those palm oil plantations right up against the, the river. Uh, and I know we've been doing a lot of work on sustainable palm oil, and they are still working on that there. But a nice, yes, this is working story, is a lot of those, um, at least right by our site, a lot of those plantations have already given back several acres of their plantations that's right up next to the zoo, so, or zoo, <laughs> the river. So there will be plantations still right over there, but they've started to recognize how important it is and give it back. So that's a nice thing. Um, there's other places I've worked that the local community and the government do not recognize such issues or what they have. And at least in Borneo um, and in Saba, especially the residents of Saba are really aware of that. Um, now, Indonesia is a totally different story. It's, it's way worse in Indonesia. Anybody else? Okay. Well, our next talk will be in January. It will not be me, so you don't have to see my face or hear my voice anymore. Um, but we will have one every other month, or every month, and they will rotate Tuesdays and Thursdays to hopefully hit everybody. Steven has been nice enough to videotape these. Um, so the last one will be out pretty soon, and this one will be too. So if you know people that have missed them, we'll be able to let them see that. Um, and we're just going to try to get through all of our projects so you guys know more about them. And please encourage everybody to come. Um, I appreciate you guys coming out um, and just ask other, others too so we can really get the word out because that's one thing we're really working on is spreading our conservation message because we're doing a lot that nobody knows about. So um, thanks again. Have a good day. Yeah. <laughs>